This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1644, previews! I'm Brian Christman. I'm Adam Murdo. And I'm Chris Everly. And welcome to the show. This episode is our monthly look at the previews catalog. In this instance, it is the March 2017 catalog for item shipping stores, mostly starting in May of 2017. It's May. It's May. The lusty month of May. <laughs> Lusty, I like that. Well, all I know is that April showers bring May flowers. What do May flowers bring? Pilgrims. Very good. Mm. Take rock down the road, folks. (laughs) (laughs) And and Bridges, let me tell you, your sonorous tones right now, (laughs) tonic for my spirit. He's got a crib sheet of synonyms for pants (laughs) and brand names (laughs) of pants posted next to his monitor. I've used Bridges before. I'm getting repetitive now. That's okay. That's fine. It's a callback. It's a callback. All right, well, before we get too – before we, we stray too far let us talk about our sponsor for this episode. As always, the preview, as always with previews, blah, 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 slow down. As always with our previous episodes, this episode is brought to you by Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com for all your pre ordering needs. As always, talk about repetitiveness. Whenever you pre order from them, any DC, Marvel, Dark Horse image title, they are right away 40% off the cover price. Most of your other publishers in the book are between 20 and 35% off cover price. They do run many specials where they can be 45, 50, 60, even up to 75% off cover price. Uh, and they continue their tradition when you pre order any new DC or Marvel trader hardcover, they are all. off cover price, and even a few of the new Rebirth titles and trade are 52% off (laughs) cover price. (laughs) They run several bundles where they group books together uh, for a special discount, whether it's Rebirth titles, other new like um, titles from um, Hanna-Barbera, DC Comics, Kids Comics, what have you there. So check out their site, dcbservice.com. They offer shipping monthly uh, twice monthly or weekly for your comics, bags and boards. Use them for quite some time. DCBService.com. Check them out. They will make it worth your while. Yes, they will. And I wanted to jump in here because I know some listeners are always interested in the retelling misadventures of Wild Pig. <laughs> uh, I am saying with far more relief then sadness. Then starting this month, I am becoming a DCB service customer because <laughs> as of May, we are getting out of the diamond business, folks. And I'm going to feel like I'm leaving my own, my own self-imposed minimum security purgatory. <laughs> so I'm looking <laughs> forward to being a business that sells back issues, back issues, back issues, like new use trades and all kinds of games. And I am – Deeply anticipating it and looking forward to being a DCB service customer because I'm getting off the Titanic, folks. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm not even I'm it hasn't even left the dock yet, and I'm disembarking <laughs> because <laughs> the combination of the ever increasing spiral well not spiraling but ever increasing cover prices of these items combined with the fact that very few people are actually buying them combined with the fact that Diamond's payment terms are shall we say to be polite burdensome. I've had enough after nearly 20 years, so looking forward to being a very casual and relaxed DCB service customer for my new books. One of us, one of us. (laughs) (laughs) But I'll say to listeners, you want to send in more back issue lists, please do so because one of the benefits of this change in our business is we're going to gradually be moving more of our budget towards more back issues and games and things of that nature which the Diamond Bill was perpetually strangling. So, How about more wall books? Pants, that is an ongoing process. You will find a nice selection at Free Comic Book Day. Yay! I love it. 
Well, before we get into the frivolity of the episode here, I just want to mention that we have now officially started our 13th year of podcasting here at Comic Geeks. That's Street. right. That's right. This is our first episode recorded and released after the anniversary. Yes, because recently on uh, March 7th, this uh, podcast celebrated its 12-year anniversary, 12 years ago on March 7th, 2005. Episode one of Comic Geek Peak was released, so huzzah! Congratulations, I guess. You know, we we weren't all around at that time. I mean, we were around. We were actually on the show at that time. It was Brian and Peter at that time. You folks can't hear this at home, but uh, I'm symbolically <laughs> patting, patting myself, myself on the back. back. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I must say, it's. I'm sorry. It's, I just want to say it's one of the great joys of my life to be part of the show, gentlemen. I thank you very much. Uh, me as well. Thank and... you for being along for the ride with yes. us, Chris. You bet. You bet. And we recently, uh, Adam and I, went to our friend Matt, a friend of close, Matt's uh, uh, place because his uh, son, Evan, had his one-year birthday. Mm-hmm. Had a little party. Actually, Kevin Moyer oh, made yes. an appearance. Ever Elusive was there the whole time. Yes. And we had a <laughs> nice discussion about comics. And it made me think of, or we were talking about, I think, like the Marvel movies or what have you. I went back into the CGS archives because all the episodes are on our website, comicheespeak.com. You can also get them all on the CGS app. And iTunes, I think, has the last 300. I don't know. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> but anyway, I, I came across episode 817, which was a comic talk episode from, like, April of 2010. Uh, to put it in perspective, it was before the release of Iron Man 2. Wow. And they had just announced the casting of Chris Evans as Captain America. So there was some nice discussion about that in the episode. And actually, the people on the episode were Brian Deemer, Peter Rios, Kevin Moyer, a rare in-studio appearance of Peter, by the way. Of course, Jamie D., Adam, and myself. Now, it's weird how the dynamic has sort of changed because Adam and I were pretty much like just quiet for the whole episode. Everybody else was taking, <laughs> taking – I mean, that, that's fine. They had that more, was our MO in those days. That's correct. I mean, so we talked about the Captain American casting. Uh, it was post-Super Show, so it's some post-Super Show um, discussions. Um, the show was sponsored by C2E2, which was the very first C2E2. It hasn't even happened yet at that time. Yeah. Uh, there was some X-Men talk. There was a little a little bit of the Jamie D. Bryan, you know, um, adversary talking <laughs> about, talk about Fables and Jack and Fables crossover. There was a little bit of friction there, which was <laughs> fun to catch up on. And uh, there was even a Stump the Rios. It's been a long time since I heard the Stump the Rios mm. theme song. But uh, so that was a fun trip down memory lane. So, but anyway, check out the CGS archives. There's, they're there for for your enjoyment mm-hmm. and your historical edification. If you're a recent listener, check out what the show used to sound like in uh, years <laughs> gone by. <laughs> yeah, I think I said maybe a dozen words for the episode. <laughs> and pants were all the poorer for it. Oh, stop it, stop it! I didn't need to feel the need to talk with these. We have such luminaries in the in the uh, the room there. I mean, Peter and Kevin in the same room in the studio. Uh, don't get me started. Wow, we yeah, it's like Sasquatch and the Loch Ness monster sharing tea in the house. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, they were talking about um, even which I didn't know. I don't think I knew since then that Emily Blunt was originally cast as the Black Widow in the Marvel movie. Really? Mm. Yes. Wow. But apparently, according to the episode, wait, listen, that she was uh, tied to, I think, Gulliver's Travels, had to back out. So oh, that's, with Jack Black. So they brought in um, wow, talk Scarlett about Johansson, who originally was turned down, you know, was a second choice or whatever. And, of course, Brian all could Brian could only focus on her in a cat suit. So it was, it's, it's a fun episode. So that was 817. So. No disrespect to Scarlett Johansson. I think Emily Blunt would have been a fantastic Black Widow. Yeah. So, but anyway, we digress. So, I mean, we how, look how far we've come in just seven, do. seven, seven years. All right. Anyway, let's get into the catalog. Anything we need to get into before we hit the pre, uh, before we hit the dark horse section, gentlemen? We're just we're gonna jump started at dark horse. You want to tease what dark- might happen afterwards? Oh, we will find God. Yes. Um, <laughs> time permitting, uh, and forewarned is forearmed. We may have a brief discussion, meaning myself and Chris. I haven't seen it on the Logan movie. Um, time for many of the episodes, so if you're hearing this right now in the episode, then we do talk about it. If you're, if you're not hearing this, you, it never happens. So anyway, I'll be able to cut it out. That covers it. Yeah. All right, on a dark horse. <laughs> 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 yeah, and we discussed before we started recording that, generally speaking, at least from Chris's and my perspective, overall, not a whole lot in this catalog to um, that caught my eye. Well, there's plenty of stuff. There's not a lot of that jumped out at me this That's month. That's correct. Yeah, my order was uh, like about $40. <laughs> it's impressive belt tightening. Yes. feel proud of myself when I come in under 100 <laughs> Wow. 
Well, one thing I would mention, um, if you're a Serenity Firefly fan on, on page 69, it uh, looks like there's a new uh, graphic novel, Serenity No Power in the Verse, by Chris Roberson and uh, George's Janty. So did I mispronounce his name properly? I don't know. Okay. George Janty? It's, uh, I'm yeah. not sure myself. So if you're a fan of that uh, universe, which I certainly am, that might be something you want to check out on page 69. Uh, there is an original hardcover on page 58 that looks good. Uh, it's written by Kare Andrews uh, with uh, art and cover by Troy Nixie, who uh, gave the world Jenny Finn uh, nearly 20 years ago now in glorious black and white. Uh, this hardcover, however, is uh, full color. It's called The Black Sinister, and it's uh, another take on the uh, urban vigilante trope, you know, a rather a disturbing uh, take on such. Uh, apparently it, it's about a, a very violent and irresponsible uh, uh, vigilante, uh, the gun-toting variety. So it's kind of like the, the, the shadow archetype. Okay. Yeah, and uh, if it were being released in soft cover right now, I mean, the hard cover is only nine ninety nine for 72 pages, but I'm, I'm going to hold out even so. But it, it sounds like a story I'd be interested to read. I, I like it. Sounds fascinating. And it looks like it has a steampunk vibe to it. Possibly. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, from, it's set in a place called Coal City, which does kind yeah. of suggest an uh, industrial revolution kind of vibe. So, yeah, yeah. maybe. On page 59, the Guild Library Edition, Volume 1. Uh, this is apparently set before the, the web series. They follow, the stories follow lonely violinist Sid Sherman trying to navigate a frustrating personal life as she stumbles on an online MMO called The Game. As she gathers friends and games, she gains confidence to confront all the problems in her life with ahem, varying results. <laughs> the Guild is a pioneer among web series, referred to by Rolling Stone as one of the, quote, the best, the Nets' best serial shows. Not to be a killjoy, I don't have much to say about Dark Horse this month myself. Um, yeah, my, the Dark Horse part of my order is usually pretty late, uh, light for me too, Chris. Um, oh, page 64, something uh, for uh, the all-ages audience. Uh, trade uh, paperback of a story called Glister by Andy Watson of Skeleton Key. Sounds like uh, my cup of tea, actually. It's about a young, uh, young girl who lives on her family's English estate. Uh, there's a haunted teapot on a wandering house and a rescue mission to Fairyland to find uh, the title character's missing mother. And I've, I've read a few issues of Skeleton Key. I think I, I, I like uh, Andy Watson's style. So that's something I'd, I'd also consider ordering. Murder does sound like it's right up your alley. All right. Um, on to DC next. I just wanted to point out, just in terms of awe-inspiring artwork, uh, on page 89, my God, look at Steve Epting's art. Oh, Batman. yeah. I, my I, God. <laughs> I, just oh, God. Read, I just read the Rebirth issue of Batwoman. Um, after reading the first the two issue uh, Detective Comics um, story that led into that, and yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, this is going to be one of the few DC books I'm going to get ongoing is is the Batwoman title. That that is breathtaking art. He's one of I mean I, he's one of the t- best artists in the business Absolutely. as far as I'm concerned. Yep. Um, I wanted to comment. I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead, please. Oh, oh thank you, Chris. Um, page eighty two, real quick. Uh, Action Comics nine seventy nine to nine eighty. Uh, the introduction of a new Superman Revenge Squad. Consisting of familiar faces from uh, Superman's death, uh, Cyborg Superman and the Eradicator, also Mungle, and uh, Metallo, the man with a kryptonite heart. <laughs> and I do believe Zod is going to be involved too, who is uh, also in this month's previews, going to join the Suicide Squad, funnily enough. Zod! <laughs> you know, I recently had on in the background uh, Superman 1 and 2, and as some listeners know, I revere the first movie especially – Terrence Stamp's majestic act overacting never gets old in that movie, <laughs> ever. It, it is – when he tries to tempt jor to join them, it's just, it's just tremendous. I wanted to jump ahead for a moment to page 110. I'm excited about this. Uh, usually I'm, I'm hot, very hot and cold on crossovers. This one, though, I, I'm steaming for. Okay. The, La- the Lazarus Contracts, so it's, it's a crossover of Titans, Teen Titans, and Deathstroke. Deathstroke, excuse me. And it's all about the writers here, folks. Dan Abnett, Benjamin Percy, and Christopher Priest. Hmm. So it looks like this, this story is going to kind of go deep into Titans' history when it comes to their relationship with Deathstroke. Um, apparently the premise of the Deathstroke is trying to use how the return of Wally West <coughs> will somehow act as a catalyst that will allow him to bring back his dead son. That's Ravage, right, Murd? Uh, the Ravager, yeah. The Ravager, yeah. So – Considering Abbott and Priest are involved, I'm uh, definitely on board with this. Uh, I'm, this, this, is, this is a crossover I'm looking forward to reading. Hmm. Have you been getting any so. other titles in the crossovers, Chris? 
Well, funny you mention that. I just picked up and started to read the first Titans trade about Wally West. Okay. Um, and I've been enjoying that. I haven't finished that. And I, I, Deathstroke I've been following, of course, since Priest is writing right. it. Right. Have not read Teen Titans. Okay. So the premise sounds captivating. Yeah, and you are right, Chris. The story is all about the writers here. And yeah. it's, it's cool to note that uh, each issue here is, is – it's not uh, just the usual creative team writing each individual issue. It, it's like a, the, the three writers seem to be collaborating on each part. Yep, they're working on every issue, which is a great point, Murd. That gives me a lot more confidence in the quality of the, st- of the overall story. Mm. Feel a little more cohesive as opposed to just like a yeah. round robin kind of thing. Yeah. What else for DC, gentlemen? Uh, well, let's see. Back on page 86, we've got uh, Batgirl and the Birds of Prey number 10, which is the final part of the Blackbird story, which is going to introduce us to uh, Blackbird, a character that was built to be the definitive arch nemesis of the birds, Joker to their Batman. Um, up on page 113, we've got a Wonder Woman annual, which is going to have uh, material written by Greg Rucka and drawn by Nicola Scott and Liam Sharp, like regular series artists of the past year or so, uh, plus uh, other stories possibly. So that could be worth a look. I've been enjoying Rucka's – I'm behind on it now, but I've been enjoying Rucka's run on, run on Wonder Woman just as much as I enjoyed his previous run from several years ago. Uh, one of the best writers in the business, and he's not disappointing on Wonder Woman. On page 114 for the all-ages crowd, DC Superhero Girls Volume 3 Summer Olympus trade paperback. School's out for summer. Ah, uh, yes, anticipating that, <laughs> which means Wonder Woman is preparing for an annual trip to visit her father, Zeus. And this year, he says she can bring along a few friends, including Bumblebee, Batgirl, Beast Boy, and Katana. You can only imagine that wackiness is going to ensue here. When they, and I, that's my little editorial there. When they <laughs> arrive at Olympus, it's not long before distrustful Ares turns his family region into a family competition, and the prize is Wonder Woman's soul. But when Ares and Strife join forces to work their battle magic on Wonder Woman's friends, will the girls end up fighting each other instead of the real enemy? Written by uh, Shea Fontana, aren't covered by Yancey uh, Labatt. Looks like a lot of fun. And uh, speaking of, of all, speaking of all ages, I'm going to jump ahead to page 127 because Murd and uh, Shane praise his book, the Scooby Doo Team Up book. In this issue, they team up with Hong Kong Philly, number one super guy. <laughs> oh my god! Oh man, because he just gave me this was issue 23, <laughs> featuring quick drama going Al Kabong. <laughs> There's a couple of guest stars in there too. Oh. I won't spoil it. For oh, you. gee. So that's that, that, that's fun comics. I, I guess they're pretty much all one and dones. Yes. Oh, that's and that's good stuff. High quality stuff. Two ninety nine yeah. cover price. Charlie Fish digs deep yes. in his research. He brings out all kinds of uh, little historical details and uh, fun little guest cameos. Oh. Good stuff. Yep. Back on page one fifteen. If you're a Bane fan, he's getting. 12 own, issues uh, maxi series. I don't know if yeah. it's a one-shot or a miniseries. 12 issues, yeah. 12 issues, thank you. Uh, written by Chuck Dixon, art and cover by Graham Nolan. So the co-creators of Bane make a triumph return to the character. Because so, he's been big right now in the, the, the Batman title. Right, as written by Tom King. Yes. Page 116, Batman the Shadow 2. Number one has not come out yet, uh, but I'm very much looking forward to that. I want to mention on page 125, I'm really enjoying the Commandy Challenge. Uh, this is issue five is in this current previews, but if, if you haven't checked out the first couple issues, they're, they're really fun. Again, the premise is each creative team leaves sort of a cliffhanger for the next creative team to pick up. So That is a beautiful good time. cover for number five. Gary, it is a beautiful cover. Gary yeah. Frank. Murray, why don't you talk about it first off the rack on page 128? Delighted, Chris. Um, on page 128, this is the uh, Young Animal uh, pop-up imprint on page 128. Um, it's a new five-issue mini uh, – six-issue, excuse me, miniseries um, called Bug, The Adventures of <laughs> Forager. And it is set within Jack Kirby's fourth world. Uh, it's uh, The Forager is a character from uh, that uh, – that uh, su- subsection of the DC universe, as established by Jack the King Kirby, it's uh, uh, the, the copy tells us it's meant to tie into the Jack Kirby centennial, since he would have turned 100 this year. Um, and so uh, it's a, it's a real family jam here because uh, the, the art is by Mike Allred, uh, the colors are by uh, Laura Allred, and the writer is Lee Allred. And uh, as the premise here sounds uh, ext- well. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it sounds extremely Kirby-esque. 
Uh, the, 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 the antagonist is apparently going to be the evil General Electric, which sounds like <laughs> exactly the kind of character that Kirby would. GE, we bring good things to life. Mm-hmm. Or to <laughs> death, as the case may <laughs> <That's> be. <correct. laughs> so, yes, that, that's going to be fun. That's going to be off the wall. And uh, it'll scratch our Kirby itch. So let, let, let's make that our, uh, our DC off the rack pick for the month of May. I wanted to jump ahead just to a couple trades because, again, I'm really impressed with DC's output of their back matter now in trade format. Um, so on page 141, they're reissuing now in their larger sort of book, quote, book, end quote format, The Hawkman by Jeff Johns and James Robinson, Rags Morales series. We've talked about this series before on the air. This is a tremendous series. Uh, I have the omnibus that collects the entire uh, – Saga in a hardcover. If you're a Hawkman fan and you want to get into Hawkman, this is the series where it tied into uh, what went on in, in, in JSA, where they, where they start to try to unravel and definitively explain Hawk, which is this is a daunting task, <laughs> Hawkman's history and origin. And it once again pants or refer back to that classic spotlight <laughs> where, where Peter Peter Rios did his uh, yeoman's duty and uh, you turned you. out uh, one of the one of the all time great spotlights. <laughs> So, yes, another plug for the CGS archive. Sp- I was a spotlight on Hawkman and Hawk Girl. Uh, That's ep- correct. Episode nine eighty nine from December twenty fourth, twenty ten. It was a gift to the listeners for the holiday season. Yes, <laughs> and he did, he did. It is, and he did an expert job unraveling what, one of the most convoluted and, and daunting histories in the superhero comics. Mm-hmm. And right below that, if you're a Teen Titans fan, again on page one forty fun one. I know these were very popular. They're reissuing the first new Teen Titans. Uh, Wolfman and Perez Omnibus. Yeah. Uh, those went out of print. I want to say they did two or three of them. Uh, I mean, that's one of the gr- all-time great superhero series of the 1980s. So if you if you want to spend the... Well, I'm sure it's close to half off on DCB service, I would imagine. If 75 you would off, pay attention to the openings, they're all half off at DC. Ah, that's, that's All correct. new trades and hardcovers, DC Marvel. Do you not pay attention, sir? Smarty pants, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All it takes is just one glance from him. Oh, smarty. stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to give you flashbacks. No, no, no. Page uh, 143, if you're a Legion fan, two hardcovers here. So you've got Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. I think this is Bronze Age material. Yes. Mm-hmm. Written by, among other people, Jerry Conway and Paul Levitz. Uh, issues 234 to 240, an all-new collector's edition. Ah, the oh, collector's editions. Yeah, how about that? C-55. So... Uh, I, were those the treasury size pants? Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that's right. Yeah, that's one of those things I loved about the seventies. I had a handful of those oversized issues. You know, Superman, Spider Man, um, Superman, Wonder Woman, um, Justice Bat- Society, Shazam. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, like the, the reprints of like uh, All Star Comics number three in like oversized mm-hmm. and, and Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Red Nosed Reindeer. There was a. Uh, I think that's where you had the Superman Muhammad Ali. That's correct. Yep. So that's a great collection, oh, and then yeah, yeah, right yeah. below that, if you're if you're a Silver Age enthusiast and of the Legion's uh, lengthy history, Legion of Superheroes: The Silver Age Omnibus Volume One, which collects their early appearances at Adventure Comics, Action Comics, Superman, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, Superboy, of course, has the classic cover of the Legionnaires denying Superboy membership yes. <laughs> uh, in the Legion. I, lo- I love the incredibly hurt look on his face too as his head spins around. <laughs> Yes. I'm on a trade binge here. The next page on page 144, this is a great collection, Tales of the Batman, the Jerry Conway hardcover. Now, if legendary co-founder Peter Rios is his heart be palpitating, art by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez mm. and Jim Aparo, Steve Ditko, Michael Golden, Don Newton, covered by Starlin. Holy cow, that's a yep. heavy-hitting lineup there. Yep, a lot of great Batman stories from the... Maybe late, bron- late, late Bronze Age, I'm th- guessing. Uh, yeah, Bronze Age. Brave and the Bold's in here, for example. Mm-hmm. It's Conway. He's one of, the, one of the all-time great comic writers as far as I'm concerned. So that's a great collection. And below that, you've got Superman the Golden Age, Volume 3. Great retro cover of Michael Cho. Again, collecting Golden Age stories. Action Comics, Superman, World's Best Comics, World's Finest Comics. Again, these are placed at the Chronicle series. Uh, 376 pages, 30 bucks. That's a good deal. And then below that, they're continuing to collect the classic George Perez Wonder Woman series by Perez and Ween. 
issues 15 through 24, Wonder Woman Annual 1. Good, good trades, DC. Good trades. And I'm going to jump ahead quickly, if I can, to page 149 uh, from Vertigo uh, Trade. Dark Knight, A True Batman Story. Uh, by Paul Dini, art and cover by Eduardo Riso. We talked about this. Actually, was one of the uh, award winners for the recent CGS awards. Right. And uh, I had not read it. And now that's come out in trade, I, I have I have ordered that because I just said, hey, you know, the, the re- listeners spoke, and I uh, should be trying it. Read that in. Got to give it a shot because it's half off. <laughs> it's cover price at it, uh, CBS. And you know, I did not realize that it came out through Vertigo. Therefore, I missed it completely as, we were, as I was going through the catalog myself. So I'm very glad you brought that up, Brian, because I will now add it to my order as well. There you go. I will add it to my order as well. <laughs> you know how good it felt just saying I'm going to add it to my order? God, <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, yeah, the Dinah. yoke. All right, now. Uh, on page 151, I, I, I have to law this every time it's solicited. For me, one of the the best series DC produced in the 1990s, Sandman Mystery Theater, Matt Wagner, Steven Siegel, art by the great Guy Davis. Again, if, if, listeners are, if listeners are unfamiliar with this, this was a – I don't know if the term you would use is reimagining, but it, it, they took the, the Golden Age Wesley Dodds character. They put him in a very noir setting. And you know they revisited his adventures, but with the sensibility of, of a writer really looking at it. Well, they, they acknowledge that it's the golden age, and, and there's characters who appear. For example, is he's very much down and dirty, like in the streets and muck of that world at that time, and the kind of criminals he's encountering. And again, probably the most sophisticated romantic relationship I've ever seen written in comics between him and Diane Belmont. Uh, this also includes the classic Salmon Midnight Theater Number One with Neil Gaiman, uh, where they actually explain how Morpheus influences Wesley Dodds in his dreams. Classic story. Uh, this is a series. If you're a fan of, of the Golden Age, if you're a fan of sort of reimaginings of the Golden Age, I just want to read a, a highly literate, masterfully executed comic, Salmon Mystery Theater, right here, ladies and gentlemen. Doesn't get much better. I and mean, again, a lot of ongoing titles we've talked about periodically. Mm-hmm. I'll always mention how great Dan Abnett's run of Aquaman is. I'm enjoying that every single month. Uh, I'm always glad to see Aquaman getting his creative due. On to IDW then. Yep. Where it's just Funko, Funko, <laughs> Funko. <laughs> it's Funko cover month, guys and gals. Yes, it is. So, so those Funko covers right, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, what what cherry is that again? Uh, it's a wild. Cherry. Wild cherry. Okay, I knew it was one of those cherries. Uh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, page 165, we have Star Trek The Next Generation Mirror Broken, number one of six, written by the Tipton Brothers, Scott and Dave, with art by J.K. Woodward. Bam. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Now, the Tiptons worked on – with Woodward on the classic City on the Edge of Forever Ellison version, didn't they? Uh, I believe you are correct, sir. Yeah. So I'm – sign me up for this. God, J.K.'s art is, is just sublime. Yeah, did, oh. I saw him posting a couple of like in-process uh, pages and yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Magnificent. Good call, Pants. Good call. Every now and then, pays at me around. Indeed. As we've mentioned before, IDW is the king of licensed properties these days. Yes, my goodness. So, there's more power to them. I mean, they got everything from 24 to X-Files, the Highlander to G.I. Joe, Transformers, Ghostbusters, Mask, for Shane, Micronauts. I'm not even hitting everything here. I mean, it's My DMNT. Little Pony. Can't forget My yep, Little Pony. My Little Pony. Thank you, Murd. But most important for me. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Uh, Pants knows where I'm going. Yeah. Two pages they give the catalog for this. Page 176, again, the what I would fair to say is legendary artist edition series from IDW, Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four World's Greatest Artist Edition hardcover. $150, 160 pages. Look at that art. Oh, my God. Issues 33, 45, 47, 60. And what, what they've done in recent editions, they did this with Kirby's Thor last one too. They put a lot of random pages and covers they've been able to assemble as well. You get such bang for your buck. This stuff, uh, it's worth the money, folks. It really is. Oh. If you're a fan of, of the original art, and you know, you know you can't possibly afford any of these pages. I sure as hell can't. <laughs> this is as close as you can get to having the real art. 
at, at the actual size, and these books are lovingly put together. Uh, the production values are, are outstanding. Uh, look at this. They got they got the, the first uh, title page of the Black Panther's first appearance, the first title page of Doctor Doom's first appearance from FF5. Uh, oh, look, look at these legendary covers. Issue 69 by Ben Betrayed. I love Lee Hyperbole. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Tremendous. You going to get this, Pansy? Uh, no, I, I, I can't. I can't. Ah! I, I, I had to stop because I'm just spending way too much money, and they're just – they're, they're lovely, and yeah, everything you said about them is is true. But you know, money spent elsewhere. You know, pantaloons. Believe me, I respect that. But I think for this one, I'm going to cough it up because it's Kirby and it's the Fantastic Four. So you're going to be happy. You'll be welcome to look at my copy. Oh, absolutely. But yeah, this is. I mean, complete issues of Fantastic Four Kirby artwork in the twice up. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh my God, it's the best. I want to point out. Uh, out of love for our dear departed Jamie D on page 184, John Burns Stowaway to the Stars, the ultimate comic art poster book. Hmm. A beautiful oversized book of John Burns' new stowaway coloring book splash images, each beautifully detailed, one presented here in oversized fashion with an all new coloring by Leonard O'Grady. Sixteen lushly colored sci fi images, all with per- perforated edges, enabling fans to easily remove any images for framing. Nice. Huh. And it's a great concept. It's certified cool. Hey. <laughs> Top to bottom, lift to right. Reading comics is out of sight. <laughs> oh, I, love, I love when Murray gets all posy on us. Yeah. It's fantastic. Reading, reading, that's my game. I would like to point something out on page 181. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, this is um, – it, it's a series called Saucer State, uh, first issue coming out from uh, IDW this month, uh, written by Paul Cornell. It's already been nominated for a Hugo Award, which does not wow. happen to mainstream comic books that often. And uh, it's apparently about a, uh, a woman who believes herself to be the victim of alien abduction who uh, rises to become president of the United States, is finally able to use – uh, her power and uh, privilege of her position to try and investigate what actually happened to her all those years ago and uh, runs into all kinds of red tape that the uh, leader of the free world should not run into. So it's political intrigue and drama mixed with Fortean conspiracy theory, and it's, it's, and it's written by Paul Cornell. So I, and Plus, it's 50% off on DCBService.com. All right, Sir Adam, I want to supplicate here because I totally miss this. I'm a huge Paul Cornell fan. And I love this concept, so I'm definitely going to get this. All right. Well, I remember – Well done, Mert. Well done. This came out it, – it's, it's the continuation of Saucer Country. Oh. Oh, you didn't – because that, that was a Vertigo book from a few years That's ago. Right. Hmm. That's right. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, because that That's came out with a couple other titles at the same time. And I picked them up, and like the, it was also with the new Dead Wardians at the same time came out as that. Um, Oh, was it part of a bundle? Yeah, well, it was part – yeah, part of a bundle, and like, they so continued on. But uh, I don't know – if I ever finished the the series, but I was intrigued. So yeah, so that this is, and now it's over at IEW because it was originally at, at Vertigo. Okay, must have been creator owned. But I'd never heard of Saucer Country, so wow. I guess no. I'm, I'm I'm coming in in the second act. Yeah, same team: Paul Cano and Ryan Kelly. On to Image Ron. Comics. All right. All right. On page one ninety eight, Cullen Bunn has a new series: Regression. Adrian is plagued by ghastly waking nightmares. To understand and possibly treat these awful visions, Adrian reluctantly agrees to past life regression hypnotherapy. As his consciousness is cast back from time, Adrian witnesses a scene of horrific debauchery and diabolism. Waking is more unsettled than before, and with good reason, something has followed him back. Adrian descends into a world of occult conspiracy, mystery, reincarnation, and insanity from which there is no escape. The cover is extremely creepy. <laughs> it's a... You know, ridge ca- a rib cage with viscera in it. So, and then mm. if that's your, you know, if the, if what I just described as your uh, cup of tea, check it out. Yeah, some kind of hideous alien annelid crawling out of the yeah. top of the of the esophagus, from the looks of it. Yeesh. Now, on page one ninety nine, I mean, I, I, I'll be opinionated here. I didn't need to have young blood come back, but uh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> Well, Cover B, Rob Liefeld doing his best imitation of Benjamin Grimm. <laughs> um, moving on. Uh, oh, wait. Spawn. The 25th anniversary director's cut. But how about on the next page, page 201, the Spawn Vault Edition hardcover? 
It's, it's signed and numbered by Tom McFarlane. It has the first seven issues of Spawn in their original artboard form. And even this is this is kind of cool. Randomly selected books will be inserted with a one of a kind sketch by Tom McFarlane. That's cool. That's I think that is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I'd I, give him props on that. Yeah, I, I never really. I don't think I ever read Spawn. I mean, I think I, I know of it, I, but uh, that's a great that's a great thing. Because again, artwork Tom McFarlane, you know, original art. I, I'm all about that. No, I, I salute that, especially because it's 175 dollars. You're getting more bang for your buck mm-hmm. um, if, you, if you're lucky enough to get one of the randomly selected books, especially. Oh sure. I mean, I, I I read Spawn for maybe the first maybe 50 issues, but I, I just got. For whatever reason, I just got bored with it. I, n- I never felt it was, it was frankly, that compelling of a book. Um, but you got to give it its due. It's been around for 25 years. Absolutely, so. yeah. Somebody's still reading it. Uh, I want to point out on page 202, Eternal Empire number one. So Jonathan Luna, working with Sarah Vaughn, they did the Alex and Ada story. I read the first few issues of that. i got to get back to it because I really enjoy what I read. They have a new series out called Eternal Empire. The Eternal Empress has waged war against the ca- countries of Saya for over 100 years, and now our sights are set on the last country standing. Within the brutal empire's workforce, a young woman receives strange visions that give her the courage to escape her fate or run straight toward it. Good creative team. This may be worth giving a shot. Page 210, Saga 43, a new story oh. arc, begins for just 25 cents. A quarter. Look at that. And there's a... Outer space western lady riding a fruit striped zebra. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, again, this is. Yikes. What's that gum? You know, that, uh, fruit striped gum. That's what I. Okay. Yikes. That's where you, stripes. <laughs> fruit stripes. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm positive that's what inspired that cover. <laughs> but it's on an you know, alien cool planet where such things on. can be actual uh, representatives of the local farm. How about that? How about that indeed? <laughs> uh, They're okay. also promoting this as a perfect jumping on point for first time readers. Uh, this is a this is a, a book I proselytize constantly and in the store and, and on the air and so forth. Uh, it, it remains without question one of the best books in the medium today. So check it out. And on the page opposite, one of my favorite titles from Image, uh, The Wicked Plus the Divine, 455 A.D. <laughs> this is uh, another in a series of these little occasional one-shots that are uh, done as a part of this series. Uh, the series is about a group of uh, mythological gods and goddesses, well, some mythological, some of them from like more contemporary religions even, ones that are still practiced, uh, who uh, as a group – incarnate themselves every so few decades as beautiful young people they live out their lives you know they, they live fast die young and leave beautiful corpses you know it, it, the whole thing is it, the major theme is like youth fame and the cult of celebrity and uh, so occasionally there are one shots showing what happened to these characters as they incarnated themselves in past eras there was one set in the year 1831 and this one's going all the way back to the sack of rome in 455 a.d so it's a Kieran, it's written by Kieran Gillen, art by guest artist Andre Lima Araujo, and uh, wow, <laughs> Good. okay, you, you went for it. <laughs> yeah, I did, and hopefully I didn't land on a landmine there. <laughs> I'm sure, someone will tell me if I did. Um, but yeah, I, I always like these little uh, period pieces that uh, Gillen slips us uh, in the course of this series, which I have enjoyed since its inception. So I will definitely be buying that. As always with Image, they continue to produce the most diverse. Uh, array of titles in the medium as far as I'm concerned. Everything, you know, I'm just turning pages, one great title after another, Sex Criminals, Southern Bastards, you got Stray Bullets, uh, Hadrian's Wall is an outstanding noir in space I've been talking about in the past, which is an eight-issue miniseries. Uh, great stuff. Great stuff. On page uh, 237, an, an original graphic novel, Nothing Lasts Forever, story and art by Cena Grace, Cartoonist Cena Grace returns with another chapter in his growing library of reflective memoirs, producing his strongest, most compelling tale to date. Quite like a year of heartbreaks, writer's block, career highs, emotional lows, and the emergence of a mystery illness, nothing lasts forever as Grace's unflinching exploration of how to pick up the pieces and find hope when absolutely everything falls apart. Sounds good to me. I always love a good slice of, lo- of just a mundane life type story. What else for uh, Image, gentlemen? Mm-hmm. Nothing, Anything? Uh, nothing else for me, no. Yep, no. I don't think for me either. Marvel it is. Let, I'll talk about our next off-the-rack, if I may. Oh, you certainly may. Uh, on page two, Secret Empire, one of nine. So if you've been following uh, Nick Spencer's take on the Captain America universe, we found out months ago that – spoilers here, by the way – that uh, 
the Red Skull got his hands on a sentient cosmic cube in the, in the, in the form of a young girl. And basically using the cube, rewrote Captain America's entire history so that he's always been now a sleeper agent of Hydra. And now the story is culminating where apparently it looks like that Cap's going to take his campaign as a Hydra uh, mover and shaker in, in, into public view. So this is a story that, that Spence has been building for months and looking forward to seeing how he's going to involve the entire Marvel Universe in uh, Steve's machinations. But uh, Nick Spencer writing, Steve McNiven art… If it's as good as what I've been reading in the regular title, that this is this is a cross a miniseries I'm actually looking forward to. Let's hope it has real consequences. Um, <laughs> and that isn't always the way with the, uh, the Marvel <laughs> miniseries. Well, I mean, I'm generally so, generally speaking, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of times they just kind of get lost in the shuffle as the years pass. You even forget what ha- what happened. A lot of these things. I think Civil War is a good example of when when it does have permanence and you really remember the impact of that story. A lot of them though don't. We'll see what happens here. I should point out that, that, that much of the Marvel catalog is now dominated in terms of uh, tie-ins to this event. So almost every Marvel title is going to be tied into Secret Empire, certainly through page uh, 13 of the, their catalog here. <laughs> so just bear that in mind. And if you're new to the crossover uh, format, just to reassure certain listeners, if you're not familiar with that, you can read the main story, ignore everything else, you'll be fine. So, <laughs> that's what you know, I just, usually do. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you, there could be some great uh, fleshing out, you know, and, and just some more nuance in some of the stuff if it's if it's deftly handled, uh, but not essential, especially because you know it's it's expensive if you try mm-hmm. to get all that stuff. And oh, pants! It must be made because there's an all new Guardians of the Galaxy series. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just in time for the new flick. Yeah, on page sixteen and seventeen. Some synchronicity, huh? What a coincidence! Yep. And. Uh, yeah, I was a little bit curious about it, but again, it, it's the old man in me. It's shipping twice a month, and it's mm-hmm. like I can't. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm 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 I got my Silver Surfer, got my Thor. That's all I'm really doing at Marvel right now. So well, that's two of Marvel's best titles. You're you're yeah. doing fine there. And they continue this trend on page eighteen, Rocket number one. Excuse me, as in Rocket Raccoon by Al Ewing, fine writer. Yeah, this you – know, I, I usually don't have that much time for the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy comics or spinoffs these days either, Brian. But this one, this Rocket series, I might check out for one simple reason. You see those characters uh, identically dressed behind Rocket there? Uh-huh. You recognize them? No, but I'm sure you do. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, hot move. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it, this goes back to the very beginnings of my comics fandom because those, that's the tech net. That's Scatterbrain. Oh, God. Numbers, Pharaoh Squared, and China Doll with hard boiled Henwe down there, the little chick <laughs> down there. Characters created by Alan Davis during oh, his run on. It all comes back to 2000 AD. <laughs> yep, and uh, he carried them over with ah. him to Excalibur, which was uh, drawn by Davis and written by Chris Claremont, and one of the first uh, comic series I ever collected. I remember the TechNet fondly. I'm glad somebody else does. I, I may pick up this series just to see them. Wow. And on page one of the theme continues with I am Groot, number one. So if you're a fan of that character, especially in, in his regenerative stage, I want to check that out. On page 22, they're giving the uh, young version of Jean Grey, part of the X-Men who traveled through time in the old X-Men series, which I enjoyed thoroughly, actually. Mm. Uh, written by Dennis Hopeless, art by Victor uh, Ibe- um, Ibanez. I'm sorry. Ibanez, thank you. Uh, so the, apparently the story was, the premise is based around Jean Grey having to grapple the fact that her her adult self was consumed by the Phoenix. So Jean, a Jean Grey Phoenix story can be powerful if it's well handled. Mm, I think they can also be over, they can also be oversaturated too. So so that goes. Dennis Hopeless is one writer that I trust, Chris. Indeed, this is kind of uh, exciting. Gen- it's the first. Ahead, Bert, I'm sorry. G- no, I'm sorry. It's, it's the first Jean Grey ongoing series there has ever been. That's true. Uh, Generation X returns on page 24 and 25. Uh, Jubilee is, is apparently part of the team here. Has uh, Danny been informed? I will let her know if she has not been informed. Christina Strain writing, Amilcar Pina art covered by Terry Dotson. And then on page – ooh, they're turning out. Page 26. Yeah, a lot, a lot of new this, number ones. My goodness. Yeah, this I'm interested in. Great... <laughs> oh, stop it. It's, it's, that's what they're, they're calling it. Oh, really? Yeah, S R E S 
U R R letter X I O N. That, that that's the that's the branding for all of this. I was unaware of that, but thank you for that, Mr. Murdo. Murdo the Mighty. <laughs> uh, great creative team on cable number one: James Robinson and Carlos Pacheco. Oh gosh! Wow! Wow! Yeah. I don't need to even read the the copy. I'm going to get it because they're doing the book. Um, yep. Robinson. Also, actually- I'm very- Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did, did Robinson did actually write a few issues of Cable back in the mid '90s. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yep. Okay, so this is not his uh, first uh, go round on the character, but I'd like to see what he brings to it uh, so many years later. I'm excited. On page 30, I, I nominated David Walker as the breakthrough talent of 2016 for his work on Shaft, Power Man, and Iron Fist, other Planet of the Apes licensed properties. Here he's taking on Luke Cage in a solo series. In immediately. It's David Walker writing Luke Cage. He's done a wonderful job in Power and Iron Fist. I'm definitely going to read this. Yep, I knew you and would be and able to resist. Mer, Mer, you'll be interested because you, you know the history so well. So Dr. Noah Bernstein mm-hmm. apparently is dead, so the story revolves around that premise. Who, he's the guy who gave Luke Cage his powers at Seagate. Right. So, and we should point out as we're recording, in just a f- less than two weeks, Iron Fist on Netflix. Yes. Looking forward to that. May of course, 17th. We'll be That'll be your uh, St. Patty's Day 17th. present. Yeah. Indeed. Looking forward on page 35, Avengers 7 by Mark Wade and Mike Del Mundo. Doom! So the, the, the so called reformed Doctor Doom as the infamous Iron Man is joining the Avengers. Can't wait. In the hands of Wade, guaranteed to be fun. Pants, as you mentioned, The Mighty Thor just continues to be one of the great titles Marvel's producing right now. So that's on page 37. Great stuff. Yeah, I'm kind of bummed there was not a Silver Surfer solicited this month. That's right. You're correct. A lot of ongoing books, of course, that we've mentioned on and off throughout the months. Pages 42 and 43, we've got a bit of 90s nostalgia here in uh, Venom number 150. I'm sure they they did some creative (laughs) math and added together all of his solo miniseries and solo series and so forth to come to that anniversary number. Okay, I was going to say, wow. (laughs) Yeah, there's um, so, so it, it's going to be uh, written and drawn by uh, kind of an all-star cast of creators, including uh, David McLeany and Ron Lim. It's going to be a story done by the pair of them. Ron Lim being one of my favorite artists of the '90s. So it's going to be 56 pages, 5.99. I am actually ready for trades, unless you guys want to talk about certain other single issues. Uh, the, I just, actually, I want to. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mary, I want to put it quickly on page 64. That's a breathtaking Daredevil cover by uh, Mike Diodato. Um, I, I've fallen woefully behind in that series, and that's one of my favorite characters. i got to jump back in, but that artwork is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Sorry, Mer, go ahead. Uh, we got a Gambit sighting on page 83 for X-Men <laughs> Gold number four. Um, and they're, they're bragging about these uh, X-Men uh, titles, X-Men Gold and uh, X-Men Blue, double shipping every month. You know, as if we're supposed to be pleased about that. <laughs> uh, and then... Um, of interest mainly to you, I think, Chris, um, on pages 94 through 96, there is a uh, Star Wars crossover happening in Marvel's Star Wars books. It's called Screaming Citadel, and it uh, brings uh, Dr. Afra together with the regular Star Wars cast of uh, Luke, Han Solo, and so forth. Thank you for pointing that, Murd. All that matters to me is the fact that it's being written by Kieran Gillen, Jason Aaron, which guarantees that I'm probably going to enjoy it immensely, so mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Great stuff. Again, the Star Wars titles that Marvel's been producing have been I, – I don't think – none of them have disappointed me, honestly. I mean some are, are better than others, but they've all been entertaining. And in the case of the, the Flag title and the Kieran Gillen's Darth Vader title, it doesn't get any better. So I wanted to point out, speaking of that, on page 102 and 103, or into, into the hardcovers, if you're a Star Wars fan, this is a fascinating uh, offering by Marvel. Star Wars, the Marvel UK omnibus hardcover. This collects Star Wars stories that were rarities printed in Britain in Star Wars Weekly, Empire Strikes Back Monthly, Star Wars Monthly, Ewoks Annual, uh, Pizzazz, a favorite of Merge there, um, and – I've actually read a couple of these over the years, and among others, some of these stories were written by Alan Moore. And I remember reading one of the Alan Moore stories, and it was great. So you got a roll call of glory here. Archie Goodwin, and Chris Claremont, John Stokes, Alan Moore, Steve Moore, Steve Parkhouse, Pencils, Walt Simonson, Dave Cochran, Carmen Infantino, Steve Moore, Adolfo uh, Bugala. I just killed that name. I'm sorry. Alan Davis, John Stokes, Hunter Bucks, 
but 50% off at DCB Service. That's correct. <laughs> uh, and on the next page, this is the hardcover I'm ordering this month for myself. I, I was hoping they would do this. The Complete Darth Vader by Ke- Kieran Gillen and Salvador La Roca. Issues 1 through 25, Annual 1 and Star Wars Vader Down and Star Wars Issues 13 and 14. If you're a Vader fan and or a Star Wars fan, if you have not read this book, you are not wasting the 50 bucks. If you go through DCB service, treat yourself. This is a riveting take on Vader his, as a character in the events. You know, takes place uh, after the events of uh, episode uh, – for a new hope, or forgive me, merge Star Wars, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> thank you. That you're quite welcome, sir. This is a, this is a flawless series, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's one of the greatest work of LaRocca's career, uh, and it's 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 one story, so it's worth getting in this format. I'll be getting in this format for my library, even though I've already read them all. I cannot recommend this highly enough. Easily one of the crown jewels in Marvel Star Wars offerings thus far. Highest recommendation. That's on page 103. A lot of great Star Wars trades, Poe Dameron, Volume 2, Dr. Aphra, Volume 5 of the Flag title. Interesting on page 108, they're doing a Punisher omnibus where they're collecting a lot of his early appearances. So Spider-Man 129, 134, 135, 161, 162, 174, 165, all Bronze Age appearances. Giant Size Spider-Man 4, Marvel Preview 2, which is his origin. Marvel Super Action 1, Captain America 241, the classic Daredevil Angel Dust issues 182 to 184, Spectacular Spider-Man 183, and the the, the classic uh, – I think it's uh, – is it Alan Grant? Hold on. Stephen Grant, I'm sorry, and uh, Mike Zek miniseries from the 80s. Good stuff. Good Punisher stuff. That's on page 108. And of course for me, the greatest Punisher writer. They have the Punisher by Garth Ennis omnibus new printing, printing all of the early uh, – Marvel Knight stuff, including Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe. Look at this pants here on page 111. The Planet Hulk omnibus. If you're a Hulk fan, this is essential Hulk reading. And they're doing a new Kirby uh, omnibus of Mighty Thor, Volume 3. Now, this is great stuff. This is late Silver Age, early Bronze Age Thor. So you have writing by Lee and Con- Conway and Larry Lieber, pencils by Jack Kirby, John Buscema, and Neil Adams. Every issue is great, basically. It's and this, it's ev- a transition um, from the go ahead, Murdom. Uh, go ahead, Pants. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And every original letters page included. Oh, oh, fantastic! That I missed a, that. That is a nifty bonus. Mm-hmm. This takes you the transition from the Kirby era in the Silver Age to the Conway Buscema uh, early Bronze Age. And let me tell you, <laughs> John Buscema is no slouch when it comes to rendering Thor. So, great stuff there. Ah, on page 118, I've been raving about the Avengers Four miniseries by Wade and Kitson. Stories that take place between the panels in the, in the, the days of Cap's Cookie Quartet, the Silver Age. This collects the whole story, which is coming to an end, I want to say, this month. Outstanding. I, I, I think – go back to JLA year one, waiting kids and just do this type of uh, homage to the old stories. I don't think anybody does them better. Actually, two more things I want to mention. Forgive me. Uh, these are also great collections. On page 134, this might be up your alley, Murd. Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, The Way to Dusty Death, collecting a lot of classic – Spider-Man, Doctor Strange team-ups. I think that's one of the great team-ups in Marvel's history, Spidey and Doc Strange. as He was referred to him as Doc, of course. Uh, going all the way back to the Silver the Silver Age, Amazing Spider-Man Annual 2, uh, Marvel team-ups. Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, The Way to Dusty Death, Untold Tales of Spider-Man Strange Encounter, which is a great uh, Kurt Busiek uh, story that he did with uh, – I forgot who drew that. Forgive me. Good collections there. And Amazing Spider-Man Epic Collection, Craven's Last Hunt. Okay, there are certain Spider-Man stories if you're a fan of Spider-Man, everybody should read. This is one of them. Uh, you guys, have you guys both read this story? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have too. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is a classic. Uh, again, Spider-Man done with the ramifications of Craven burying him alive, essentially. Uh, one, of the, one of the great works in J.M. Demetrius' career. Uh, can't recommend it enough. It also oh, it also concludes the classic Spider Man vs. Wolverine by Jim Owsley, who's now is Christopher Priest, great espionage story during the Cold War. And I, again, it's too much great stuff here, I gotta mention it. <laughs> Page one thirty nine, one of my all time favorite Avengers stories, Avengers the Children's Crusade. Alan Heinberg, stunning art by Jim Chung. Oh, this is great stuff. Uh, it's involved the young Avengers, uh, history of the Scarlet Witch. This is a classic story. I highly recommend that too. I've shot my bullet at Marvel, but good stuff there. Good, a lot of good stuff coming out. All right, the rest of the book. The rest of the book. 
Uh, I'm going to start Abstract Studios Motor Girl Volume 1 Trade. Yes. Ugh. It's, it's going to have the first five issues, and it's half off at DCBS seven ninety nine. Do yourself a favor. If you haven't been getting the issues, get the trade, because it's Terry Moore artwork. I mean, I'm going, like, like uh, Chris said, other things, I've gone on and on about this, and, you know, it's great. As you should, Pants is <laughs> one of the greatest living creators in comics. I mean, and Motor Girl is further testament to that. All right. As you mentioned in the beginning of the show, I have to admit this month, and I went through the whole catalog you know, diligently today, not a lot jumped out at me. One thing I want to mention, again, because I always love a good history comic, on page 266 from the Aftershock label, Pestilence Number 1. It's the late 14th century, and a great pestilence, the Black Death, is sweeping across Europe, killing over 100 million people. But what if history as we know it was a lie? What if in reality this was no straightforward plague, but the first non-recorded zombie infestation of man? <laughs> Ex-Crusader Roderick Helms and his fellow, bl- quote, black ops agents of the church, Fiat Lux, must seek out the cause of this undead outbreak and vanquish before mankind ceases to exist. Written by Frank Thierry, art by Disney illustrator Oleg Okonev, and covers by Eisner Award nominated artist Tim Bradstreet. Oh, God, Aftershock gets heavy hitters. Mm-hmm. So that, 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 I may check that out. Uh, just a couple of pages before the Aftershock uh, uh, section of the catalog. Uh, from AC Comics on page 264, uh, we've got issue three of Big Bang Universe, which is what remains of Big Bang Comics. A bunch of uh, characters were analogs of classic uh, uh, superhero characters. Uh, you know, there's Ultiman, who equals Superman, and Night Watchman, who equals Batman. They've been published uh, sporadically since the 90s. I, th- I, think they were with, with, I think they were with Caliber Press originally. With Image for a while, and this is where they've ended up at AC Comics. Uh, it contains a uh, oh, it's a, a Night Watchman story co-written by Roger McKenzie, Chris. Oh, fantastic. Underappreciated bronze and copper age talent there. Um, and I would absolutely be buying it if it weren't nine ninety five. I mean, it is an 80-page giant, but even so, I, I, I always have to balk at paying $10 for any single issue of any comic, even if it is less at DCPService.com. I well, what you don't have to pay $10 for, Murd, is on page 278, Casper the Friendly Ghost gets a new comic from American Mythology. So if you're a Casper fan or a fan of, you know, uh, Hot Stuff, The Little Devil, <laughs> uh, The Ghostly Trio, Wendy the Good Little Witch, they're all there. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, not at all. That was well worth it. Casper the Friendly Ghost. Uh, on page 272, we have what looks like a new uh, small publisher uh, launching a slate of titles here, Alterna Comics. Uh, they've got four new books, uh, Adam Rick, Amazing Age, which seems to be traditional superheroics, Croak, uh, which is more horror, and Lilith Dark. And uh, these are all uh, – they're all miniseries apparently, but the first issues of them are the promotional price of $1.50 each, printed on, quote, nostalgic newsprint <laughs> with a glossy <laughs> cover. Aww. And two of them, Amazing Age and Little of Dark, are certified cool by Diamond. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, page two. Murder, 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 I'm sorry. Was that a Fat Albert moment for you or just uh... – uh, It may be interpreted that way if, if you like. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Go ahead, Murder. Um, I'm looking at Archie at this point. Uh-huh. Yep, and I think you know what I'm going to be saying. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Page 286. Uh, the actual uh, solicitation for Jughead number 15 doesn't reflect this, but there's a full-page ad just before it that does, and the actual text also does. Uh, new creative team for Jughead, uh, where Mark Wade, writer of the Archie series, is jumping over and co-writing Jughead uh, with Ian Flynn, uh, who has written a bunch of Sonic the Hedgehog comics, uh, also for Archie, with art by Derek um, well, wait, yeah, it's, it's still Derek Charm doing the artwork, but yeah, it's uh, Mark Way taking over there as the uh, tension between Jughead and Sabrina the Teenage Witch continues to uh, <laughs> percolate. I'm actually jumping ahead to Boom to 309. This sounds like a good all ages book. The Not So Secret Society original graphic novel, written by Matthew Daly and Arlene Daly, illustrated by uh, Wook Jin Clark. Madison, Dylan, Emma, Aiden, and Ava have pretty much normal lives for a group of 12-year-olds. They go to school, participate in extracurricular activities, and oh yeah, they also have awesome adventures. Together they form the Not-So-Secret Society, but when they invent a candy-making machine for their school's annual science fair, things don't go according to plan, and their candy creation comes to life and escapes, threatening to destroy the entire city. That sounds fun. 
I get that from my, my younger son. Another good all ages uh, original. Uh, well, it says soft cover. I don't, I'm not sure if it's uh, collecting. Oh, yeah, okay, collects the first four issues. It's called The Backstagers, anyway. Uh, it's on page 311, and it's by uh, James Tinney and the Fourth and Ryan Sai. Sig- Continuing the all ages theme on page 312 from Boom, a new Adventure Time original graphic novel. Our uh, dear friend Daniel Corsetta was, has uh, worked on some of these. Uh, this is by Jeremy Cerise and Zachary Sterling. Uh, so if you're an Adventure Time fan, you're getting it. It's called the – with three O's, the Orient Express original graphic novel. That, that that sounds like it could be fun. I got to point out, Pancho Le Priest is on page 313. Once again, <laughs> Boom doing a wonderful job with these covers for the, the Planet of the Apes Green Lantern crossover. Uh-huh. I enjoyed the first issue of that quite a bit. So that you've got – You've got a, a tribute to the classic uh, Speedy revealed as a junkie cover from uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. You've got a, a take on, on the movie poster uh, for uh, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. Of course, you've got a, like a Mego action figure cover. The, the great stuff. Just love that attention to historical detail there. Yep. I should point out, by the way, you know, I, I missed this earlier, but... On page 327, 320, it's always nice to see they're still doing reprints of Classics Illustrated, uh, which I think is really cool. For those who are unfamiliar, Classics Illustrated was a long-running series in the uh, at least the 1950s through, I don't know, 60s, maybe even 70s, yeah. uh, where they, they, they did uh, comic versions of a lot of the classic you know, pieces of literature uh, in uh, the English language. Uh, and some translated, you know, as well. So they got Buffalo Bill, Kit Carson, the Pioneers, the Oregon Trail, Wild Bill Hickok, fun stuff. Now I want to point out. Go ahead, Bird. Yep, I, I just wanted to throw in there that I did buy the Alice in Wonderland Classics Illustrated reprint that they did a little while ago. Did I, you enjoy it, my friend? I'm happy to have it as a part of my collection, Chris. Excellent. Uh, on page three thirty from Dynamite, if you're an Atari fan. For twenty-five cents, just like putting the quarter on that Galaga machine, uh, you get Sword Quest, which apparently is based on Atari Sword Quest Challenge from from the, the days of yore. So that, that that might be fun. The first Atari comic in thirty years is nostalgic and meta, incorporating the infamous Sword Quest real world contest into the storyline. So now on page 332 here's our next off the rack I'm extremely excited for this I want to compliment Dynamite on the outstanding quality of the James Bond stories they've been releasing many written by Warren Ellis uh, so also one by uh, uh, Andy Diggle this is a new 48 page one shot by the great Kieran Gillen I'm, I'm in that's enough I mean it's James Bond written by Kieran Gillen art by Antonio Fuso uh, 799 48 pages this is our third off the rack pick uh, for this month's previews, so can't wait to read that. I, I, I love Bond, and they've been doing a wonderful job at Dynamite in adapting the character. Um, pages three thirty six and three thirty seven. There's a double page uh, spread here devoted to a new miniseries from the world of uh, Alex Ross and Jim Kruger's Project Superpowers, uh, brought to you by the creative team of Ryan Brown and Pete Woods. It's called Hero Ki- uh, Project Superpowers Hero Killers, and it's about a group of like, a little brat pack of uh, golden age uh, public domain uh, teen superhero sidekicks: uh, the, t- the Black Terror's partner Tim, Captain Battle Junior, and uh, Sparky, kid partner of the Golden Age Blue Beetle. I always like to see these characters being used. I'm afraid it's going to be uh, mainly for laughs this time out, so I'm a little trepidatious, but I'll at least you know, <laughs> take a look at it on the rack. I want to point out on page 354, uh, this is a wonderful creator who do, I think does just – it makes such an important contribution to the medium and the type of work he does, the niche he fulfills, which is Guy Delise. Um he does story – he's done a series of travel logs in comic form where he's, he's gone to Pyongyang in North Korea, Jerusalem, um, among other places. This one is called Hostage. It's about a Doctors Without Borders uh, official who is, who is uh, kidnapped in the Caucasus region of, of Russia, which, is a, which has a lot of uh, political instability in it uh, involving Chechnya and, and that general region. Um, and it's just about how the man is held hostage for three months and what he what he endures. Uh, it, it's, I'm sure this is going to be great. Everything this guy has done has, has been just top quality. So 
I recommend that. I'll be checking that out. What else, gentlemen? I'd like to jump back uh, for a couple of things. Please. Here. Um, page 301 under Black Mask, which is uh, Black Mask Studios, which is kind of a newer sort of maverick publisher that has not uh, been afraid to – that has not shied away from publishing some pretty politically charged content. A uh, new series called Collexit, which is uh, a bit of speculative fiction about uh, California breaking away from the union as a result of the recent uh, presidential election and what has followed. <laughs> so it's uh, kind of like uh, No Man's Land on the West Coast – or sorry, DMZ. That's what I meant. Uh, and that's, then, a, that's an interesting premise. And on page 327 from uh, Canadian publisher Chapter House, uh, we have a new take on Phantoma, Phantom Jungle Girl, uh, a, a Fletcher Hanks character uh, with her invisible face there, uh, on, uh, well, written by Ray Fox. So uh, Fletcher Hanks produced some of the strangest comics of the Golden Age. So see what a contemporary creator is able to make of uh, one of uh, his uh, group of characters. That's a great. That's a great premise. Fletcher was the last name. Fletcher what? I'm sorry, Martin, I missed that. Fletcher Hanks. Okay, because I've looked at some of his work. Because uh, I forgot which company. Forgive me. Some years ago, did some collections of his work. And you're right. It is. It is far out stuff <laughs> when it comes to golden age material. Definitely worth checking out, especially if you're interested in the history of, of that period. On page 388, a new book from Oni Press, a, dollar, a, a one dollar debut issue, The Damned, written by Colin Bunn, art by Brian Hurt. Covered by Bill Crabtree in a prohibition era world where demonic princes pull the strings that make crime families dance. Eddie is immortal with two things working for him. First of all, he can't die. Well, he can and does quite often, but doesn't stay down for long. Second, Eddie runs the Gehenna Room, a nightclub with a strict, quote, no demons allowed, end quote, policy. But blessings and curses don't look all that different these days. And finally, to tell the two apart and get a guy killed over and over again in Eddie's case. So one of Eddie's old pals shows up seeking sanctuary. Eddie knows he's in for a double cross, and that means walking the line between salvation and damnation once more. I like the idea of a prohibitionary gangster story with a d- demonic flavor to it. <laughs> so sounds interesting. Yes, it does. There's something I just remembered from the Archie part of the book. Uh, Brian, did you notice that there's going to be another Art and Franco thing coming out? Uh, yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah, so. Oh, terrific. It's on page 286, uh, same as the uh, Jughead issue I mentioned. Uh, it's uh, Little Josie oh, and yes. the Pussycats. <laughs> there was a biography of Billie Holiday. I, damn it, I forgot where it is. Um, forgive me, I'm, I'm failing miserably here. I'll commit ritual seppuku later. Some company, I can't find where the hell it is now, I apologize, uh, is doing a biography of Billie Holiday, one of my all-time favorite singers, uh, and just about the, you know, the, the, some of the tragic aspects of her life. Page 385. You know what, Pants? I was just in a foxhole about to be overrun <laughs> by the onrushing horde of barbarians, and you brought, you brought the ammo can. It's, what else is there to say? It's just typing, searching into DCBS. That's all. <laughs> don't, don't, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Oshkosh. <laughs> don't diminish your contribution. Come don't. on now, here it is. Yep. 385. <laughs> Billy Holiday hardcover. Jose Munaz, Carlos Sampaio, one of the most important American singers of the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so that may be worth checking out if you're a fan or just interested in, that, in the history of that time period and all that goes into that, the racial dynamics and so forth. And it's also certified cool by Diamond. All right. <laughs> All right. Now, here is a series that I always have to give special mention every time it shows up in previews. Uh, it's on page 406 uh, from Studio Farlin, Farlin the Goblin number 5. All right. Now, this it, – it, it's an oversized book. It, it's longer than it is high. So it, it's 11 inches long. Chism. And uh, seven inches high. Um, it's the ongoing story of Farlin the Goblin, who is a tree spirit of sorts. Uh, goblins are uh, caretakers of forests of the Oddlands of Wug. And uh, Farlin, under circumstances yet to be revealed, uh, was uh, put out of his forest, the forest for which he was responsible. And he's traveling through the several dozen different Oddlands, you know, there's, uh, each of which has a, a bizarre theme to it, you know, a quirk, like a fantastical quirk of its ecosystem. Uh, there's the Racelands, where uh, every 
everything is done uh, by uh, competing in races. There's the salt lands where everything's made of salt. And now he's found his way in this book to the vault lands where everything is kept under lock and key. And it's about him and his uh, little tree sidekick, Aaron Wart, and uh, a couple of other friends he's picked up along the way as they journey around trying to find a new forest for him to protect. It, it's kind of a, a mild allegory for finding one's place in the world. And that's what Farland has been doing. It's, it's, it's reminiscent of Bone uh, by Jeff Smith. It's uh, a total labor of love on behalf of the creator who's, who's known only by the initial J. Right, right. Yeah. I remember that from you telling me about he you, you met this person. Yes, Jamie and I actually that's right, years that's ago right. met him at the New York Con. So uh, we, we know what the J stands for, but we're not telling you. <laughs> and he, it, it's the first uh, of his first name. We don't even know what his last name is. He, he prefers not to be known. He's not looking for acclaim or fame here or anything like that. He, he prefers his, his work to stand for him. It is a labor of love for him. He has a day job at which he must labor in order to afford to put this book out. Um, and so that's why it appears so in, infrequently. That and because he obsesses over the quality of each issue. He doesn't p- offer it for sale until he is satisfied with the quality of the work. And I completely respect him on several levels for everything I've just Absolutely. related to you. You know, his uh, preference to allow his work to uh, take the credit over he himself and also the fact that he just devotes so much time and puts so much of himself into it. Um, so this is a story that is it's suitable for all ages. I recommend it to readers of all ages. Um, it has the Jamie D. seal of approval, and I place my own stamp right next to it. Highest recommendation, as you like to say, Chris, for Farland the Goblin. Ah, splendid. And right beneath I want to, at the very, ahead, oh, it's very bottom of that page, 407, are the order codes for the previous four volumes. On page 474, I'm, I'm jumped into the book section. I'm looking forward to this, uh, where I hope Nicholson, the spectacular sister of Superwomen hardcover, uh, this takes you through the history of female uh, costume crime fighters, Miss Fury, soft spies like Tiffany Sin, sci-fi pioneers like uh, Gail Allen, Little Lulu, vintage art, publication details, a decade-by-decade survey of industry trends and women's roles in comics, spotlights iconic favorites – I'm really looking forward to this book. Uh, without giving too much with it, there's a particular series of spotlights I'm considering trying to tackle eventually, and this book will be a great help to that. That's all I'll say about that. So I'm looking forward to ordering that. Uh, I'm looking at page 438. You know, it's our monthly look at tomorrow's publishing and what they have oh. to offer. Uh, this month's issue of Alter Ego magazine, number 147, is a full-length tribute to one of the most prolific gentlemen and all-around nice guys of comics' golden and silver ages, Otto Binder. It's got yes. Captain Marvel shaking hands with Uncle Sam right there on the cover because Otto Bender is probably best known for his work on the Big Red Cheese. Also some key Superman work, but just tons and tons and tons and tons of other comics material. There, there are very few people who can claim to have written more comics pages than he – than then Otto Bender. Um, there's one Paul S. Newman who I think holds the uh, Guinness World Record. He wrote mainly for Dell back in uh, you know, the 50s and 60s. Uh, but Otto Binder has a long and storied career, and this issue is uh, pretty much all about him. And it, it's, uh, it says here in the copy that it's the first time that Alter Ego has devoted a, uh, a giant size section to the Fawcett Collectors of America. Special intro by longtime uh, Fawcett FCA Poobahs, B- uh, Bill Shelley, and PC Hammerlink. Uh, so that, that's a big deal, and it's something I'll probably be checking out. Binder deserves the tribute. Uh... Below that, back issue 97 focuses on Hawkman and the Bronze Age. That's all I need to read. I'm in. I mean I get these magazines every month. I don't always get the time to read necessarily every article in them in a timely fashion. I actually have a pile of them on my nightstand that I've, I've read only parts of, but that's fine because I can always return to them and find new gems to, to discover there. Again, no, this company is so vital to capturing the history of the medium we all love. Uh, on page, for example, 439, the collected Jack Kirby Volume 7 soft cover. Collects issues 27 to 30, in-depth look at Kirby's 70s Marvel Comics work and his 80s work in comics uh, and animation. I, pff, I'm buying that immediately. I mean it's I, – I just – I fall to my knees in homage to tomorrow's. Just the work they do is invaluable. I've actually shot my bolt personally. There's one other thing I wanted to mention because I did go to the back of the book because I always like to look at the oddities back there. <laughs> Nothing jumped out at me at much this six month except for one thing. That I, I just I have to mention because I haven't seen something like this in a long time. It's always good. it takes me right back to my childhood. On page five ninety eight, new DC superhero Pez dispensers, <laughs> very much in the style of, of like the, how the characters appear today. So you've got Batgirl, Harley Quinn, and in her uh, Argyle sweater, Supergirl with with the, the collar, and Wonder Woman. 
Boy, those look fun. Yeah, based all on the DC Superhero Girls line. Yep. Uh, you guys have anything else you want to mention from the, the latter parts of the book? Nothing for me. Yeah, Murderoo? I, I don't think there's anything for me either, Chris. All right. Ready for some Logan talk, Pants? Well, I mean, how much time do you have there, sir? I, I can I can give you at least 10, 15 minutes. All right. Well, uh, I'll let you start because I'm, I'm woefully inept at these movie reviews other than to say, oh, I liked it. But uh, I, we could talk, of course, spoiler, spoiler, talk about Logan right now. Um, I, I saw it recently, and obviously Chris did as well, and tried to be a little timely with our conversations. So, um, yeah, the final, well, the swan song, as we understand it, for Hugh Jackman is Wolverine. Yes, and I was really looking forward to this film because I really enjoyed James Mangold's take on the character in the in the Wolverine, the movie they did a couple years back, is mm-hmm. when he had an adventure in Japan. Um, I loved Mangold's take on the character, how he, he did make everything constant fight, and there were some great quiet moments in the Wolverine. So I was looking forward to this film, especially when I saw the premise. How it's it's loosely inspired by the classic story, Old Man Logan, but it's also very much obviously tied into the X-Men universe that's been established in the films these past 17 years. Again, I just think about that. Hugh Jackman has played this character for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And I saw him on Colbert, and he was talking about the regimen he has to go through to maintain his physique uh, all these years. And I, you know, I hats off to the man because obviously he's well paid for it, of course, so it's (laughs) like I feel bad for him. But, you know, it, it, I think the guy's a great actor, and from Back in 2000, when X-Men came out, and I felt he'd nailed Wolverine right from the get-go, and I think he's taken the character on a wonderful arc. I think he's been the linchpin of this whole series of movies. I think he's the best part of a lot of these movies. And this film, did, not only did it not disappoint, I personally I think it is the best film of all the X-Men films that have been produced. Uh, I actually was deeply moved by this story, both as a fan of these characters and as also as a parent. Um, they... I think Patrick Stewart should be nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his work in this film. Yeah, I wasn't uh, even aware of going in. He was in the movie. That's how much I pretty, oh. much, I, I pretty much avoided. All I knew was that you know it was uh, based on uh, Old Man Logan-ish. There was X-23 in it, and I, think one of, I pretty much didn't know much of what was going on in it. That's how I like it with these movies. And I, oh my Indeed. God, it was Patrick Stewart. And mm-hmm. it's like, he was in the commercials, but... I didn't see any of the commercials. Right, no. granted. Well, granted that... When you the premise, of course, is that this is several years into the future. Yeah, twenty twenty nine, I believe. Is, the year is it? Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. And so you get the impression all the X Men are dead except for Professor X and Logan. And what I loved about this story, first of all, and it, I always love this approach to, to a narrative. They don't really fully tell you what happened and how they got to this point. There are illusions, mm-hmm. and you get a sense that. Things over at Westchester may have gone haywire in a way that led to the deaths of a lot of the X-Men, and it's years later. And what was great about this story was, yes, it's about these two super heroic figures, but it's also about mortality. And it's about how yeah. these two characters who – I mean Log- Wolverine is you know not immortal but obviously live a lot longer than average people, and and how they're both essentially decaying from age – um, you get the sense Xavier almost has some form of dementia that's affecting his powers um, to a potentially lethal degree for those around him. Uh, the adamantium of Wolverine's body now is essentially slowly killing him uh, and poisoning him. Uh, they're, they're cranky. They're at, each, they're at each other's throats. Wolverine's – he's like a, a limo driver to make ends meet. He's taking care of Xavier. Uh, Caliban is in it, one of the Morlocks. He's one of, one of the few surviving mutants apparently. Um, played by Stephen Merchant, who's um, Ricky Gervais's comedy partner. I thought he was he was well cast. Uh, this is a powerful movie. Forget whether or not you know a lot about the X Men; it doesn't even matter. Um, it's just about two men who have been through so much together, who clearly had this great love for each other. They're devoted to each other, but you know, they're also there's a lot of ugly history there as well. And it's 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 basically it's it's the culmination of of. The Hugh Jackman character's total arc through all of these movies and how at the end of the story – and I won't give away the, everything, but at the end of the story, how it comes down to Wolverine alone essentially has to do what he needs to do to ensure that mutant kind will survive and that eventually there will be like another generation of X-Men. Um, and it's also about 
loyalty and about someone realizing what it means to be responsible for a child and to love a child um, because as Pads mentioned, X-23 – and by the way, the, the young girl playing X-23, oh my gosh. her performance was phenomenal. It I was. mean considering – for, yeah, go ahead, for a good part of the movie, she she's mute. Yeah, it's and my son turned to me and said, "God, she's a better actor than all the older kids in the movie." <laughs> and, and I said, "I said, you know, the, the, her performance in this film is 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 sublime." Um, and I've I've I, I I'm a big fan of Hugh Jackman as an as an actor in general. And I, I and but he really captures just what the years and the toll have done to the Wolverine character, both physically, uh, mentally, emotionally. Uh, this is a powerful film. I, I think it took the whole franchise to another level, um, and there's great pathos there. I mean, and, and Patrick Stewart. I mean, he's a Shakespearean actor. I mean, he's a tremendous actor, and you really feel just what his character has gone through and how badly, he, both mentally and physically, he has decayed as a consequence of what has transpired in these latter years that we don't we only get glimpses of in the backstory of this movie. Um, but yet at the, at the core of that, there's still that drive and that passion to, to, to keep moving, to, to, to try to ensure you know, mutantdom survives. And, uh, and, and, and if you're also a fan of Wolverine as an action film, you won't be disappointed because – Oh my, no. I yes. mean, pants, the brutality in this Ugh. movie. And it's, it's, not done, it's not there for, for, for cheap effect. Like it, it serves the story, but – I mean, you, you, if you want to see Wolverine cut loose, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, I'm like, oh, my will. God, yeah, I'm being on the screen all the time. Yeah, get him, get him. You know, just really get into that. <laughs> and what, what I also loved about the film was Mangle is also really making a Western here in a mm, sense. Yep. And he pays tribute in the movie to one of my all-time favorite films, the classic movie Shane from the 1950s. And the movie Shane actually serves a purpose in the plot of the movie Logan. Uh I, I I can't recommend this film enough. Uh, you know what do we give? What's our max Freckin swears? Is it four or five? five? It's a scale of five. It's five. Uh, it's some of the excellent movies have been hit or miss for me. This to me is is right at the top. Uh, it, it's yes, it's in that universe, and you know it's in that universe. But at its core, it's a movie about family and loyalty and redemption, uh, and you know, and and trying to you know sort of renew your purpose. Uh, but uh, again, um, warn listeners: do not bring little kids to this movie. Uh, it, it is it's it's savage in, in terms of the, the depiction of the violence and what Wolverine has to do, and what he endures to to get to where he needs to be at, at the end of the film. So, uh, I, I can't I can't recommend it enough. Uh, and what a breath of fresh air after the extremely mediocre X Men Apocalypse. So. What do you? What, anything you want to add to that, fans? Yeah, I mean, I can't add a whole lot more to that. Uh, like I said, I, I went into it really not knowing too much about it. Patrick Stewart, like you said, just absolutely knocked me out with his performance. It was just a a broken down version of Professor Xavier, and just you you feel for him and the moments he has with 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 Logan, uh, the, the the comedy moments, the father son ish kind yeah. of moments. Uh, it's a tremendous the. Yes, it's set in the future, but it's not like a huge sci-fi crazy no. future. I mean, yeah, you see um, driverless trucks, which is about the only thing you know of like in the future. But, I mean, there's still – And the Reavers, who are cyborgs from the comic book, oh, were used right, as, right, right. As, as like assassins by, by this – well, by the adversarial factions in the film. We'll leave it at that. So Yes. And then, you know, seeing X-24, that, that whole yeah. thing huh. and – Oh my gosh! Yeah, like you said, I, I was thinking sitting here. Yeah, this is kind of like a, a, a it had the western feel to it. Yeah, uh, it's, I really can't add too much more with to your 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 speech on it yet. But I, I thoroughly enjoy the movie. I probably have to go see it again. Um, but yeah, just I, I love going to these movies, just not knowing anything about it. it, it it's tough with you know going on the internet, you know, not having spoilers or even casting things. Like I, I was just. Yeah, it was a, was a great movie. I really can't have much more to that. Than and without spoiling the end, it would be interesting to see where they take the franchise after this film. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm interested to see what they do with that. I mean, I guess – I mean, there's still, I, I guess, if they want uh, stories from the past that they can tell, I suppose. Oh, sure. Um, but, but uh, you know, it, it's 
Oof. Just see it. <laughs> it's if you're a Wolverine fan, you're an X Men fan, you're just a fan of, of the type of movie we're describing. Uh, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. And, and as Pan said, the the acting the acting is, is is at a superior level here. Like these are two great actors who have worked together on all these films for all these years, and they get the opportunity to take the characters they've been developing for 17 years on sort of this this final arc to, to its culmination. And as a movie-going experience, it's deeply satisfying. So, you know, here, here. Yes. Have have now you gonna go see it now, Mordon? Or <laughs> I'm sure I'll see it eventually. Oh, oh eventually. <laughs> I have a bold recommendation, though, saying that uh, uh, Patrick Stewart deserves the uh, cat- the uh, supporting actor Academy Award for. It. I think he should be. I think he should be nominated. Absolutely. So. Have we shot our bolt, gentlemen? I believe we have. All right, All you right. want to recap? Why don't, you, why don't you put our OTRs? <laughs> Reading each other's minds here. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. All right, so uh, for DC, uh, the author rack pick for the month of May will be Bug, uh, The Adventures of Forager uh, by the All Reds, uh, first uh, issue of a miniseries. Uh, for Marvel, uh, the pick will be Secret Empire number one, and the independent pick will be the uh, James Bond one shot uh, from Dynamite. Uh, uh, I was trying to remember the subtitle. It's a big forty-eight page one shot, and the title is Service. Uh, right, found on page three thirty-two of your catalog. So those are the off the racks for me. All right, and once again, this episode was brought to you by Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com for all your pre-ordering needs. If you'd like to send us an email, the address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. If you'd like to send us a voicemail, the number to call is 267-702-6642. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. We're at Comic Geek Speak. Encourage everyone to stop by thecomicforums.vanillaforums.com to check out our forums. Uh, Leave some feedback, uh, comments about this episode and many others. Tell us what you're ordering from previews this month, if you like. And participate in some discussions with lots of other comic fans and or uh, uh, listeners of the podcast. Uh, We'd like to thank everyone who's donated to the show. We really appreciate it. Couldn't do the show without you. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. Like the seasons and everything